something special real this morning for you guys. Go ahead and take a seat and turn your attention over here to the baptistry. This is my uh, oldest daughter, Jerry, and um, she wanted to get baptized here with you all. Whoo! I thought I had it. <laughs> Let's go. 
This is, you all are our church family, and you all helped us raise her in the faith. So we thank you so much for that, for discipling her and teaching her about Jesus. And she's been asking for a couple years now about baptism, and we were like, why are we keeping delaying this? <laughs> this is good. And so we did a baptism study for Ms. Waltham, and she got to meet and interview all of her family about why they chose to follow Jesus. And today, Jerry's going to give her life to Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you two questions, okay, Jerry? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes. Today, do you take him to be both Lord, meaning he's the master of your life, and Savior, because he saved you from all of your sins? Yes. On that profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. surrender. This is my surrender. 
Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We join in celebration with the Huffers and Jerry joining the family. It's so exciting. God, we, we remember that time in our lives when our faith was fresh and new and we remembered, God, how much you did for us and what it meant to us to have our sin taken away. Jesus, you surrendered first. You left heaven. You put on flesh. You came to this broken world. You lived among us perfectly and in an event that wasn't fair, you died. You took our, our sin and our pain upon yourself, God. And we move into this time of communion where we, as a church body, as a community, we get to remember what you did. And we don't do it as just part of a regular tradition or religion, God. It's, it's a, it is a sacrament that we remember that is deep it's meaningful, God, and as we take the bread, we remember your body that was broken and, and given for us. As we take the cup and we drink, we remember the blood that was shed for us, God, and we, we thank you. We celebrate it, and we remember we love you, God. Amen. At this time, go ahead and move and, and take communion together. Father, I pray that we would be um, vessels uh, that you can use uh, to further your kingdom. I pray that we would make room for you, that we would be obedient to your calling. I pray that not a day would go by where we would forget the sacrifice that you made of your son and that we would honor you in our actions and our thoughts and our words. 
I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for your truth and that you loved us so deeply. Father, would you use us today? It's your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to College Heights. Yes, good morning. It's great to be with you guys this morning. Um, my name is Becca White, and um, I'm telling you, I feel like I'm still catching up on a little bit of sleep. I got to go to mix with our middle schoolers last week. So, if you, yes, we had a blast. We had a blast. And we'll tell you more about that here in a little bit. But we did. We had a good time, didn't we, guys? We're feeling a little tired today, so, um, but it's great to be here with you. Um, if you are a guest or if it's your first time here, um, we'd like to have an opportunity just to get to know you and say hello. So if you don't mind texting the number on the screen, um, 417-281-3974, and that number goes to my friend Ashley. She is our Connections Minister here at the church, um, and she would love to, like I said, just say hello, get to know you. Um, she has a gift that she would love to give you, so don't hesitate, pull out your phones, no one's going to judge you, um, and go ahead and text that number right now. Um, also, I uh, want to make you guys aware of a couple things. Um, we've talked about it the last couple weeks, but our annual congregational meeting is happening today, and it will be right at the end of service. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to wait. Um, it's going to be right at the end. I know Rick was really worried last week about getting out to the food, so we will get there, I promise, um, but if you'll just stay with us, and um, even if you're not a member, we'd love for you to listen um, and have the information. We'll talk about our annual budget for the fiscal year, um, as well as confirm the two incoming elders um, for this next season, so please stick around for that. Like I said, it'll just be right at the end, right in here, um, and you'll have a time to be able to ask questions if you have any at the end of that. So don't go anywhere. We'll give you the ballots if you're a member to vote. Sound great? Awesome. Okay. I'm going to take that as yes. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, also, uh, so following that is our celebration um, to celebrate. Uh, he's not over here, is he? I don't know where he is, but to celebrate Cy um, and Monica as they are uh, heading into a new season of life in Naples, uh, Florida. We are all jealous, right, of the nice, nice weather. But honestly, we want to celebrate the ministry that they've had here and the time that they've had and um, love on them a lot um, and be able to spend some time with them. So after service today, we'll have hamburgers and hot dogs and lawn games and all that good stuff. Um, so we'd love for you guys to stay around and be able to partake in that. I also heard that there's going to be some bounce houses. And as far as I'm concerned, there's not a weight limit. So I say, let's all partake. Sound good? Actually, there is an obstacle that is quite fun, so you should check it out. Um, but we hope that you're able to stay and join us with us in that. And then also, um, one last thing I want to tell you about is on the 4th of July, um, the, for the last few years, Southern has been the host of the 4th of July show um, and the fireworks show. And so um, we are so close to them, and we want to be able to take that opportunity to just love on our community. So this year, um, on the 4th from 5 to 8 p.m., um, we'll have hot dogs, we'll have some activities, the bounce houses will make their appearance again. Um, and so we want to invite you guys to come watch the fireworks show um, from the parking lot and, um, I don't know, maybe meet someone new, um, but love on our community in that way. So we're really excited to do that. Um, want to also remind you uh, that there are four ways that you can give here at College Heights. One of them is through chjoplin.org slash donate. The second one is through the Church Center app on your phone. Um, you can also always mail a check to 4311 East Newman. That's here um, at the church or at the giving boxes on your way out, the little black boxes. Um, one thing I want to share with you is that because of your giving and your generosity, um, we got to take 38 people to mix this last week. And mix is our middle school camp. Yes, absolutely reason for celebration. Let me tell you, you guys, yes, we did not sleep a lot. But what a blessing this week was. There's so many things I could tell you. I told Craig earlier, I was like, man, I could stand up here all morning and tell you about the awesome things that God did during that time. Um, but if it's okay, I think I've got some students in the room that are going to help me do this. We'd like to share what we learned with you this week. Is that okay? All right. Okay. So here we go, guys. You ready? We are undeserving. Nevertheless, yes, a little louder. Jesus is for us. We want control, nevertheless, Jesus is over us. We are dead, but nevertheless, Jesus is alive in us. And we are imperfect, but nevertheless, Jesus is working through us. 
thank you for allowing our students to go and partake in that this week. Like I said, it was a tremendous blessing. Um, and if you see a student around, they're around, find them and ask them what they learned this week because I promise you, God moved and it was a blessing. So thank you for that. Can I pray for us as we continue service together? Is that all right? All right. Father, I love you. I thank you for this church family. I thank you that... Um, we get to fellowship together, that we get to laugh, we get to be silly, we get to play in bounce houses of all things, um, but more than anything, we get to come together and we get to learn about you. We get to engage in your word and your presence and your promise. We get to do life together in the hard and the good and the in-between, just the mundane, but you are present in all things. You are there and you see us. Thank you for being such a great God that we can always count on and always go to whenever we need anything or even if we just want to sit. We love you, and it's your name we pray. Amen. I've had many people ask if that was me in the video. <laughs> and the answer is yes. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says this. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. I have one question when I read that verse. Why does Paul look ahead? Like you would think Paul, writing his last words to his protege Timothy at the church in Ephesus, who is awaiting his execution in Rome, would want to look back. Like he would want to remember, he would want to reminisce. And yet, for some reason, Paul looks ahead. And today's my last day as lead pastor at College Heights. And these are my last words to you. And I, I don't know about you, but I have found myself all week looking back. I'm looking back and remembering the last seven years of ministry. We were with some of our elders on Tuesday night. And we, just, we just remembered and reminisced. And we looked back over the last seven years. The very first words I said when I came here seven years ago um, at our church, the very first sermon I preached was about ordinary disciple making leading to extraordinary world changing. I believe that with all of my being. I mean, it's our mission as a church. Make disciples of Jesus who change the world. We pastors changing. That's not changing. That's who we are. That's our mission as a church is to make those disciples. And we believe that when you take ordinary, unschooled people, regular people like you and me, and you teach them how to follow Jesus and be a disciple of Jesus, that they will change the world and that we are changing the world. That's what we believe. And yet, we didn't really know how to define a disciple. And so, our elders and ministers spent a year asking three questions of every single verse of the New Testament. What do disciples look like? What do they do? And how are they produced? And from that study, we define a disciple with these three things. They follow Jesus. Anyone else know this? Being changed by Jesus and on mission with Jesus. That's what a disciple is. And that's what we've been trying to make over these last seven years and then we kind of realized something as we dove into that, that we were really good at caring for people inside the walls of this church, but we weren't as good caring for people outside of the walls. And so we did a series called You Belong Here. I don't know if you remember that, but we, we, it's why we hang these things up in the atrium, because we want to be hospitable to those who do not yet know Jesus. We want every person that comes into contact with College Heights family to feel like they belong. And we've worked hard 
at caring for both people inside the church and outside the church. Thank you for the changes that you all have made. We have people now who come to our church and say, we feel so welcomed. We feel like we belong. Thank you for doing that. It's not people with name badges that are doing that. It's you all that are being hospitable to those who are in need. And then that next year, we celebrated 50 years of history as a church. The College Heights Christian Church has been in this community for over 50 years now, but for 50 years, we had a big celebration. We had a a birthday party, and and we had all the preachers come up on stage and talk, and they didn't talk that long. And then we had all the different worship styles that we we played over the years, and we had a big unveiling of a sending wall down the chapel that we want to, we've been a church that raises up and sends workers out into the harvest field, and we want to continue doing that. It's why we have all the flags of the nations in this room. That's who we are. And we realize that in order to fulfill that, to ignite a movement of disciples making disciples and sending out workers into harvest fields, we had to remove some obstacles that have gotten in the way. And so we did a generosity initiative called SPARK. Anyone remember SPARK? Yes, SPARK. And the biggest obstacle, there's a lot of them, but one of them was to eliminate our debt. And in January of 2020, because of the generosity of this church, of you all in this room, we are now a debt-free church. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. That was January of 2020. Something else happened in 2020. It's called COVID. We were doing services at home, major disruption, volatile political season, a lot of divisiveness over race and politics and masks and vaccines. We as a church were not immune to that created some real hardships. We had a lot of church turnover, giving dropped. We had staff layoffs. It was a really rough two years. And somehow, I think I know how, we got through it by the grace of God. And we did last year, we said, you know, we've got to unite our church around our two primary convictions that life transformation happens best in a family. And that belonging to the family of God means you belong to the mission of God. We called it our Unite Challenge because being a family on mission can be at war with each other sometimes. We want to unite those two around five rhythms. You remember this? My hand. We want to celebrate. That's one of our rhythms as a church. We don't ascend to greatness in God's kingdom, but we descend into service. We celebrate. We serve. It's not good for this finger to be alone, like my mom would say. It's like not good for us to be alone. We must belong to each other. And we have a ring finger. This is our treasure. We lead our heart with our treasure. We give. We celebrate, serve, belong, give. And then the pinky is this covenant, this pinky promise God made with us that through you all nations will be blessed. And so we go. And here we are. Seven years later, this is us. This is our church. We have held on to each other. We have held on to Jesus and the gospel and the mission. And I believe the greatest days of College Heights is still ahead of her. And I am so grateful for this church, you all in this room, enduring the hardships along the way. And yet, Paul doesn't do what I just did. I mean, look at it. He doesn't look back. You would think he would want to look back, but he doesn't. He looks ahead. He says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. That's a future thing. We're in the presence of God, the judge of everything. He will be judging everyone and everything in the future. And he says, and in view, you get that kind of perspective language? In view of his appearing in his kingdom. You see, Jesus' first appearing was the initiation of his kingdom, or he kicked it off and started it. But his second coming is going to be the culmination of his kingdom, when he finally makes all things new. And Paul is saying to Timothy, hey, lift up your eyes take off the blinders let me pull back the veil and show you the future that's where we're headed he doesn't look back he looks ahead that's the context of Paul's last charge to preach the word so why the content why does Paul say to Timothy hey Timothy preach the word was Timothy like not preaching the word Was he shirking his responsibilities? Was he ignoring Jesus' mandate? Nothing in the text seems to indicate that. What he might be doing is getting shrinking back out of insecurity. And the reason is there's there's these two disruptions that were happening in the church, first Christian church of Ephesus at the time. Here's the first disruption, the first issue going on. False teachers were raising their voice. 
You see it all over the letter of 2 Timothy. You have this person and that person. Paul addresses it directly and indirectly. Watch out for false teachers. They're seeping into the church and they're deceiving you with half truths and 90% truths. And they're leading people that were Timothy's faithful few away from his voice to their voices. And it's working. Look what Paul says in verse 3. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. We love taking that verse and saying, see, culture is going to hell in a handbasket. Paul wasn't writing about the Roman Empire. Who was he writing to? The church. You see, It's not just false teachers are raising their voice. The false teaching and the deception is so close to the truth. It's just a little bit off. The best lies are 90% true. Timothy is watching his congregation, the people that he was counting on, abandon him and the church and go off and follow someone else. There's nothing more that erodes the confidence of a preacher than that. Timothy is questioning everything. He's questioning his competence. He's questioning his his commitment. He's questioning his call. Like, should I be doing this? You see, here's the, the second thing that's happening. It's not just false teachers are raising their voice. False teachers are gaining a hearing. And Timothy is questioning everything. And Paul says, take off the blinders, Timothy. Let me pull back the veil. Lift up your eyes and look ahead of you. You've got to visualize the future. You've got to begin with the end in mind. That's more than just one of the seven habits of Stephen Covey's highly effective people. It's more than just imagine what people will say about you at your funeral, what you want them to say about you at your funeral, and live like that every single day. This is not a visualization exercise. Paul is saying, Timothy, God is rescuing this messed up, jacked up world. He's redeeming it. He's renewing it. He's restoring it. And you, little old you, you have a role to play in that. I'm capturing you up in my grand narrative of making all things new, that good will overcome evil in the end. The light is pushing back the darkness, and we're replacing hell on earth with heaven on earth. And you were made to have a role in that, Timothy. He's saying, lift up your eyes, Here's my message today in a nutshell. Broaden your perspective. Deepen your commitment. Like in view of what Jesus is doing, like in the presence of the almighty God, deepen your commitment by broadening your perspective in in, in two, what I'm going to call two realities that Paul teaches Timothy. I think they're helpful for us today, too. Here's the first one. Back to verse 2. He says, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. I'm going to approach this verse like a journalist, the good who, what, when, where, why. What is preaching the word? The mandate is to the charge to preach the word. What does that mean? Correct, rebuke, and encourage are the three words he uses. The gospel typically comforts the disturbed and disturbs the comfortable. Correcting error, rebuking sin, and encouraging sinners who aren't there yet. That's what the gospel does. When do you do it? In season and out of season. Let me interpret that for you. Always. Every day. Preach the word. Every day, announce good news. When it's raining, when it's shining. In winter and summer. When you've had a bad day, when you have a good day. When you're at work, when you're Sabbathing. Do it always. How? With great patience and careful instruction. It's going to be hard. Earlier, he uses three metaphors to describe this life of a disciple of Jesus. It's the soldier, athlete, farmer. Three people that have more discipline and work harder than anybody else, right? It's like, this is going to be grueling. It's going to be ordinary. It's going to be a daily grind. But then comes the question we're all asking, who? Who is this for? 
Because you might say, it sounds, Si, like this is an old pastor, Paul, writing to a young pastor, Timothy, to preach the Bible from stage to people in seats. Right? Like, you might be thinking, I, preach the word, like, me? You're telling me to do that? Like, I don't feel competent to preach the word. I don't feel compelled to preach the word. I don't feel called to preach the word. Friends, you got to understand the context that Paul is writing in, in the first century. Like, there's no division between clergy and laity. The pastor and the congregant doesn't exist. Right? There's no buildings, there's no pulpit for a preacher to come walk up behind and deliver a 25 to 35 minute monologue. Like that doesn't exist. There's no organization of the church, there's no bylaws or board of directors of the church. Paul's in prison, awaiting his execution. And Timothy is like just young guy who has all these people meeting in homes and, and in schools, learning about the gospel and about Jesus. And he's trying to hold them together. Don't listen to that person. Don't listen to that person. Watch out for that false teaching. It's not like board meetings and, and, and taking notes and was it Robert's rule of whatever it's called. And the church is not an organization. It's a movement. It's a movement of ordinary unschooled people that are adopting abandoned kids and bringing them into their homes, that are caring for the sick, that are eradicating economic institutions like slavery. They're inverting leadership structures all across the world. They are changing. They're, literally, it says that they, the, 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 the world looked at the church and said they are turning the world upside down. And they couldn't grasp them. They couldn't point to where they met. They weren't voting on bylaws and board members and, and building activities like the color of the carpet. They're loving their enemies as themselves. They're turning enemies into brothers and sisters. That's the church. And Paul is telling to Timothy, hey, lift up your eyes. Look at the larger picture. Begin with the end in mind. Broaden your perspective. Deepen your commitment because false teaching is creeping into the church. And it's happening today too. The lies of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. That something and someone other than Jesus and his kingdom can fulfill your deepest and longest desires. And it's a lie from the pits of hell. That's why Paul says to Timothy in verse 5, but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. These are not offices, they're activities. It's like share the gospel, literally preach the word in the Greek, ready for this? Announce news about Jesus. Like he came to this earth as a person, he died on the cross for our sins and rose again, and that good news is reliant upon people like you and me with our words and our deeds showing and telling others about Jesus. It's only good news in, in, unless it gets to people on time. I went to visit some of our global partners in Japan a number of years ago, and I went to Kyoto, where we have church planters that planted a church a few years ago that we partner with. And, and we were there, we were visiting them, we were talking. And, and Japan is, the, the Japanese people are the largest unreached people group in the world. 130 million people, less than 1.2% are Christians. And I said, hey, go down to the mall. And this, like, it was just like marketplace slash malls, like this weird thing, I know what to call it. And they said, walk down this corridor. There's so many people in Japan, they're all pretty much saturating these huge, massive cities. And they said, walk down that one hallway and start counting all the people coming, uh, you know, coming the other direction, and count their faces, and you'll be able to count 500 faces, there's so many people. And then I started counting, one, two, three, not out loud, four, five. And they told me, the first 499 faces that you see are those who have never heard of Jesus and are going to spend an eternity without him. That man. That little girl with her grandma. That businessman running to another meeting. That elderly man sitting on the bench watching the world go by. 
And then I got to the 500th face, and I was just weeping. And I turned around, and I looked back at all those people heading, and it was like this outdoor corridor that, they were, that we came into. And so I could see all of them going into this light, and there was just this vision God gave me of 500 people, 499 to be exact, heading out to an eternity without Jesus, and they've never Paul says this in Romans 10. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone, anyone, announcing the news of Jesus to them? God is looking for someone. He's saying, whom shall I send? Whom shall I go? He's waiting for someone to say, here I am. Send me. The first reality is the reality of the word. The word has to be announced. Will you? Here's my message. Broaden your perspective. Deepen your commitment. I'm going to finish with this. I don't know why I said finish. I got a little bit more to go. Don't look at the clock. Oh, okay. Verse 6, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, old Paul gets sentimental, right? Like, he's saying, yes, look to the head, look to the future, broaden your perspective, deepen your commitment. But you now have an old man who's writing to a young man, and he's looking back, and he's remembering what he has come from. I mean, he's using phrases like I'm being poured out like a drink offering. That's language about persecution and that you're going to be killed and give all for your faith. You're poured out. Everything's gone. And he's saying, it's time to come for my departure. That word is the idea of like a ship leaving harbor or someone who's been camping that like tears down the camp, puts everything in the backpack and leaves the campsite. Paul's on his way out. And he's looking back and he's encouraging Timothy. He's looking back, but Timothy's in the midst of it. Like Paul's looking back and saying, hey, I fought the fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. And Timothy's like, I'm in the fight. I'm running the race. I'm trying to hold on to it. It's like drinking soup with a fork. It reminds me of uh, grandparents. You guys get it best, don't you? <laughs> you get to watch your kids try to raise kids, and you get a laugh. And you're like, oh, I remember when you did that to me. Hey. You deserve it. <laughs> right? I, my dad does this, um, and he's a jerk. Um, he, I remember he would just sit there and watch Monica and I with, like, our, our one- and three-year-olds just, like, running around. Like, no, don't do that. Stop that. Don't touch that. You know, blah, blah, blah. And he just sit there. He would just laugh. I was like, shh, get, get out of my house. And, and, he would, and, and, and what he would do is interesting. He would, he would encourage me by telling stories about when he was doing it, with, 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 uh, when they were raising toddlers, right? He would say, man, I remember we were so tired. No naps, no sleep, no adult conversations, and I just could not keep my eyes open. He said, I would, I would put you in the corner of a room, and I, now you know what's wrong with me, and you'd put my feet on one wall and my head on the other wall, so I'm like a gate, and give you toys, and I would just collapse. So that in order for them to get out, right, not them, us, it was me, in order for me to get out, I'd have to crawl over him and wake him up, and then he just said, it's a great season. He goes, but it just gets sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. And for some reason, that mean story encouraged me. Like, that's what Paul is doing. He's thinking back to what he went through to encourage Timothy, who's in the fight, who's running the race, who's trying to keep the faith, to hold on. But the reality is not about the race. The reality is what comes next in verse 8. Now there is in store for me the crown. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. There will be a day, church, when every single one of us will stand before the ancient of days. Jesus on the throne. And after our fight and after us running our race and after us keeping the faith, we will get to hear those precious sweet words come out of his mouth. Well done, good and faithful servants. It's a 
crown that we, we shouldn't inherit. It's a reward that we haven't earned. It's an honor that we do not deserve. It's a gift of Jesus' righteousness to us. He died, he raised, he gives. And the question, the reality of the crown is this. That's the second reality. We have the reality of the word. Will you preach it? Here's the reality of the crown. Will you receive it? Like, stop trying to earn your place, to prove yourself, to fulfill your potential, to overcome your sin. He's saying, come home, sinner. He's saying, welcome back, abuser, addict. Guess what? You don't have to be a slave anymore. Here's a crown that I paid for that is yours. Broaden your perspective. Deepen your commitment. This is my last words to you, church to lift up your eyes, to pull back the veil, to take off the blinders and see what God is doing and the role that you get to play in this grand story. There are these things in New England called rescue societies. Have you heard of these rescue societies? Um, you know, in the 1700s, there, the 1800s, there would be these, these groups that would, that would go to buy lighthouses. And as ships were coming in the harbor, there was no, like, official Coast Guard or anything like that. These are just regular old people like you and me. They would get their boats, put them by the lighthouse, and they would go sit and watch and wait and make sure the ships that were coming into the harbor would avoid all the rocks, right, and not crash and not die. And, and so sometimes they would go out to the ships and help guide them away from danger in their boats. And other times when ships would get into trouble, they would go out and they would rescue the people on the ship and bring them to shore, and these people would gather, and a lot of times they'd go out there and nothing really would happen. And so they kind of got bored, and what they would do is they would cook a big meal and eat together, and they'd play games together like cornhole or bocce ball. That's not accurate. <laughs> and they would do these fun things together, and slowly but surely they just got kind of tired of, of, of getting their boats ready, of training to be ready for the day when the ships might sink, because it doesn't really happen that often. And they kind of stopped doing those things. And over time, they, 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 they began loving more and more the food and the games and the gathering. So much so, they were like, do we need to meet the lighthouse anymore? There's a lot of other better venues in town. Like, we don't really need to bring out the boats anymore. But you know what? I like getting together. We should keep getting together. We should keep having the meal. We should keep having the fun. And over time, slowly but surely... These rescue societies realize that that's not really what we are anymore. And they change their names from rescue societies to yacht clubs. Church, you are commissioned by God to be a rescue society. Don't become a yacht club. Broaden your perspective, deepen your commitment right? Run the race, fight the good fight, fight, finish the faith, and there will be in store for you a crown of righteousness the Lord will give you on that day. This is my last charge to you. Tomorrow, my wife and I get in a U-Haul and a van, and we drive. We leave. We, the staff was loving all the different um, ways to call the celebration, celebration, all the kinds of stuff. And they called it, they all said, come say sayonara to Sai. And I can't remember who it was, but someone stuck, it was Kayla. She stuck her head in my office on Thursday and she said, we looked up what sayonara actually means. You know what it means? I said, no. She said, it means goodbye forever. And she said, that's not what we're saying. And the reality is, it's not what we're saying. Like, we're leaving tomorrow, and we may not see any of you ever again this side of heaven. I hope we do. I pray that we do. But there is a reality that I know. That on that day, when he comes again, we're going to be there. So you be there. We want to spend eternity with our church family here. Don't miss it. 
Receive the crown, please. My last charge to you is this. Preach the word.
You are so good. You are worthy to be praised. I pray that we take that to heart. The words that we heard this morning that were commissioned over us, God, that we would go, that we would be the light and the salt, that we would preach the word in the way that we live, in the way that we speak, at work, at home, at school. God, we would, we would shine. We would bring your light. Help us do that. We love you so much. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat, if you would. Simon, Monica, can we have your family up here, please? All of them. And if I could have the elders and any of the staff members that are here, come on up. This little girl was baptized, was not even walking the first time I met you. We love you guys. As I was thinking about today, <clears throat> ended up in Acts 20. Paul was on a trip and he stopped to visit. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> He stopped to visit the elders in Ephesus. They weren't in Ephesus, but they were meeting. Paul did some remembering. He remembered the past, what he'd done with them for, I think, three years, maybe seven years. And he ministered to them with tears and with joy. He'd done that many times. That led me to Isaiah 6, which I think I shared with you earlier, but in Isaiah 6, and he mentioned it in a sermon too, Isaiah just seen an amazing thing and saw God. And you can read the story in Isaiah 6, but uh, at the end of it, God says, whom, whom shall I send? Who will go for me? And Isaiah simply said, here I am, send me. And after a lot of prayer, a lot of discernment with other family members, Monica and Saeed said, here I am, send me. We go with you. We will continue to do and accept the challenge that you've given us. Keep following Jesus, keep being changed by Jesus and keep being on mission because we're going to do it. Let's look forward to what's going to be going on with you all. Okay. I think before, we're going to pray. Yeah, before that, I think Colby has something to do. Yeah, I've got uh, one more thing for you. I've got, this is from Mountain View Meats in Muskogee. So I've been told that's his favorite I asked what his favorite meat was, and I was told it's uh, the hot links from Mountain View Meats in Muskogee. So, got one for you. Thank you. Love you, dude. Uh, we're going to pray, and uh, as we pray, I think uh, Dale's going to pray, and uh, yeah, it's going to pray for us. And we do that, we've kind of got a tradition of doing this. So if you just reach out and join us in sending this couple to <laughs> Naples, Florida. Almighty Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love today. And we thank you for Sai and for his leadership here with us and the uh, things that we've learned as he's spoken to us and lived his life. And thank you for the things that he's learned from us as he's ministered here. And we uh, thank you for the call that he has now to touch the lives of many people. He is uh, taking some of us with him. 
and he's leaving some of himself with us. And we thank you so much for the privilege of doing that, being in this work together. And uh, I pray that you would keep him as he travels. He's still got uh, packing and, and driving and all kind of things to go. It happens when you move. And so we pray that your grace will be with him, your protection will be over him and his family as they do that. And uh, we look forward to hearing the many great things, the many lives have been touched and in some way we're part of too. And so we thank you again and again for your love and your grace and we leave him in your tender hands. In Jesus' strong name I pray, amen. Holy God, loving Father, uh, a lot of emotion today, and uh, Lord, I, I had a word I was going to use. I think you've taken it away from me because I can't remember it now, but, but uh, Father, it was a word that maybe had a little more negative meaning than, than I meant for it to be, because Father, this is an emotional day, but Lord, it's, it's filled with uh, just some forward-looking and some love, and Father, just for a, a great hope of the work that Sai and Monica are going to do in Naples to a, a people that really need you in a growing area, in an area that needs to, to hear from you and hear about you, Lord. So uh, as Sai has charged us, we charge them, go and make your word known and make you known in the love and just the craziness of your love for a lost people, Father, that you pursue them to the ends of the earth just as you pursued us, Father. Uh, Lord, we want to also honor Sai's charge to us to go as College Heights Christian Church, as this body, Father. And for most of us, our go is just outside the doors here. And Lord, let us help us, strengthen us to be bold and energetic, strengthen Sai and Monica to be bold and energetic, and uh, Lord, just fill them up with uh, your grace and mercy in the work that they do, and us here, Father, strengthen us to, to uh, go local and take your message to thousands upon thousands who need to know you, Father. Lord, I think back to I think the first time that many of us ate together with Cy, uh, Red Lobster, I think it was. I, I remember, I think, it's hard for me to remember even last week, but I remember, I think, driving Cy there in my old GMC pickup thinking, Lord, don't let this pickup be something that makes Cy not want to come and be <laughs> part of our family. And then lo and behold, I think Cy got one that may have looked a little worse than my old GMC pickup. So, but from then, Father, we knew that this was the guy and this was the family that was going to carry us through the next season. So we're thankful, Father, that you sent Cy and Monica and their family to us. We're thankful for the love that they have for this body and that we have for them, Father. And Lord, a few hundred miles and a few hours and a time zone there's no way that that overcomes the bond of love and brotherhood and sisterhood and mission, Lord, that we feel in connection, Father. And a few states away, we have another community that we share with and we love on and we hope to always be a part of, Father. So we send them, Lord. Um, ask that you protect them in their journey protect them as they set up a household and a family. Lord, again, embolden them. Fill them with every opportunity, Lord, to just proclaim you to a lost world, Father. We love them. We love you. We pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.